This is a University of Otago podcast. Good afternoon and welcome to this special forum hosted by the Centre for Theology and Public Issues here at the University of Otago in Dunedin. Thanks for joining us online and thank you also to our live audience here in this wonderful media studio at the University. My name's Andrew Bradstock, I'm director of the Centre and with me is our specially invited panel who I'll introduce you to in a moment. A quick word to our online viewers, we want you to take part in the discussion as well as the audience here. So you can do this by texting in to our special uh, number, which I'll give you and also be shown on the screen, 021-0224-7414. That's 021-0224-7414. And I've got a phone on silent and uh, we'll feed your questions and comments in as appropriate as we go along. Now our focus for the next hour or so will be the secular nature of New Zealand society. We often hear people say, New Zealand is a secular society. But what do they mean by that? And is secular a helpful term? We still have prayers in Parliament. We still have public church services after a national tragedy or disaster. We have a national anthem which references or invokes God in each of its 40 lines. And we've just had a long public holiday in honour of the main Christian festival of the year, Easter. Is that what secular countries do? Or ought we to describe ourselves as a Christian country? Are the beliefs and values brought over by the Europeans who settled here in the 19th century and which underpin many of our institutions still lingering on? Or should we look at the percentage of our population who don't attend church or any other religious worship on a regular basis? At our strong belief in separation of church and state? at the basis of our state education system, or the greater prominence given to Anzac Day than Easter. And then we'd see that we really are secular after all. Well, we're going to chew over these questions and also look at what effect our perceived secularity has on the way we do our politics and discuss issues of current concern. When I mention to people that I run a center for theology and public issues, I often get the retort, well, good luck with that then. This is a secular country. And the implication of that is clear. Religion might be all right as a matter of private interest, but don't bring it into the public square. Is that, I wonder, why we don't hear our politicians talking about faith very often, even if they have one, and a good number of them do? In marked contrast to the United States, where you can't hope to get elected to high office unless you do talk about God. Our last public event hosted by the centre actually looked at how religion seems to have taken over the Republican primary process in the States, something utterly inconceivable here in New Zealand, which is why we've called this forum, We Don't Do God, a phrase first uttered by Tony Blair's close advisor, Alistair Campbell, when he feared that Blair, as Prime Minister, was going to stray into the highly dangerous territory of talking about his religious beliefs to an eager journalist. But does that phrase describe our situation here, where not only do public figures seldom talk about religion in public, neither do religious leaders, even if they used to? And would it make any difference if beliefs and convictions of all sorts were heard more in public debates? Would that lead to greater consensus on questions of the day, or less. And which God is it that we say we don't do? As our society becomes more multi-faith, what will happen if other religions seek to have a voice in our secular public square? Well, that's our agenda for, as I say, the next hour or so. So let me introduce you to our panel, who I think are going to give us much to think about in the next hour. And don't forget the number for you to text in your thoughts and questions, 021 0224 74 one four. Well, a warm welcome to our panel. Thanks very much for joining us. Nearest me in the white shirt is um, Glyn Carpenter. Glyn's based in Auckland and is national director of the New Zealand Christian Network, which represents some half a million Christians in New Zealand, meaning that he's very much in the front line when it comes to getting the church's voice heard in the public square and wrestling with the challenge of understanding New Zealand's secularity. 
Glyn's background is in computer software. He was one of the early pioneers in that field. And he's also worked in conflict resolution and counselling and has a master's degree in counselling and theology from Faith Seminary in Washington in the States. Next to Glyn, Reverend Dr Lynn Barb, who lectures in pastoral theology here at the University of Otago and is an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church USA, serving in two congregations in Seattle, Washington, before coming to New Zealand in 2007. As well as publishing widely on church and congregational life and modern media, Lynn is a keen observer of political happenings in her country of origin and was on our panel looking at the Republican primaries last month. Dr Bryce Edwards is a familiar name to anyone who follows the political scene in New Zealand today, being widely sought after by the media for his informed and incisive analysis of the daily... You gave me this to say to you. <laughs> <laughs> widely sought after by the media for his informed and incisive analysis of the daily doings of our political leaders and parties. Bryce has lectured in the Department of Politics here at Otago since 2007. And in the run-up to last year's election, ran a highly popular series of interviews with politicians here in this studio called Vote Chat. And Bryce also compiles the influential daily digest of political news and opinion, New Zealand Politics Daily. Finally, based in the Department of History here at Otago, Associate Professor John Stenhouse is one of New Zealand's best-known and widely published historians. And if I tell you that among his recent publications are books and articles with titles like Christianity in the Post-Secular West, God's Own Silence, Secular Nationalism, Christianity and the Writing of New Zealand History, and Secular New Zealand or God's Own Country, you'll see why we wanted him to be part of today's discussion, <laughs> bringing both a historical and contemporary perspective to the question of New Zealand's secular status and the place of religion in our society. Let's give our panel a warm welcome. Well, I think it's important to get our definitions sorted out first. So I'm going to ask each of you in turn how you understand this term secular and how meaningful it is or isn't to speak of New Zealand as a secular country. What do we actually mean by the term? There's all sorts of academic definitions out there of what secularity is. What do you understand by it and how meaningful is it to speak of New Zealand as a secular country. Now, Glyn, your punishment for sitting nearest me is that you go first. <laughs> well, as you've indicated, secularism means a lot of different things. The one that, uh, the meaning that we run against most often is, is a fairly strong form of secularism which seeks to exclude religion and religious things out of the public square, out of public debate. And uh, you, you can describe secularism as being hard or soft and um, I guess when it's the soft form of secularism, which just permits any voice and doesn't give priority to one, you don't tend to notice that so often. So the one that we notice is when we come against um, things like prayer and council meetings or Bible in schools or uh, d discussions with state agencies like Families Commission. And, uh, and when the religious voice is excluded out of the discussion or marginalised for some reason, that's the form of secularism that we come across. I do like the... Um, the distinction made by Rowan Williams uh, to do with procedural secularism and programmatic secularism. And I think the procedural form of secularism, he would say, is one which permits uh, a range of voices in terms of the dialogue, uh, whereas programmatic secularism is the one which seeks to uh, control the public square and ensure that it is devoid of religious voices. So that, that's a useful distinction. Mm. We'll come back to unpack mm. some of that as we go. Mm. Lynn, your thoughts on this? Well, when I interviewed in 2006 to come here to teach, the interview interviewers said, oh, New Zealand is so secular, are you prepared for that? Well, I come from the most secular part of the United States, um, Seattle. We call it the nun zone because on the U.S. Census, more people check none for their religion than any other part N -O -N -E, of the country. N-O-N-E, not N-U-N. <laughs> Precisely. Oh. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. N-O-N-E, exactly. And I just guess I have just been flabbergasted by the patterns here. So a four day weekend for Easter? I mean, we don't, we just, we don't have any holiday associated with Easter in the United States at all. And um, a friend of mine, a Presbyterian minister, was invited to give a prayer for the Dunedin City Council as it opened. Well, I've never heard of such a thing happening in the US. And yet, and yet we have all this 
poli uh, religious political voice. I mean, my sense is neither country is secular, neither the United States nor New Zealand. I, I am not familiar with the ri wide range of definitions, but I'm sorry, a secular country doesn't give you four days off at Easter. I mean, it just, <laughs> that just does not make sense to me if oh. that, this, this juxtaposition I'll come back and we'll unpack some of the comparisons in a moment, okay. but um, Bryce, your thoughts? I'm not sure I can add much more to the definitions and um, what's been given. I mean, what Glenn said is, you know, um, seems to be about right to me, but I would stress that I think you can have uneven sort of degrees of secularism. So, um, you know, and that's what we're seeing. Exactly. We're, we're yeah. seeing, you can't say that New Zealand is secular, full stop. There's elements of secularness and there's mm -hmm. um, parts yeah. where it's very uneven. And that's what will lead to all these um, you know, apparent um, contradictions. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what's really interesting to explore because some of them are trends, some of them where the tide's going in or going out. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I think um, hopefully we'll come to terms with in this discussion. Mm. John. <clears throat> A couple of historical reflections. Um, <laughs> uh, firstly, I think that um, a public debate uh, and indeed you know, private debate would be enhanced if people were uh, sort of clearer about um, what they meant by terms like secular, secularism, secularisation and so on and so forth. They're often bandied about but it's not clear uh, what people mean by them. Interestingly there's a whole bunch of new scholarship coming out uh, overseas in this area partly because many Western scholars, until fairly recently, have taken the, you know, terms like secular and secularism as sort of unproblematic, the, the, the sort of default common sense position. But uh, I think the resurgence of religion, which has taken a lot of, lot of social scientists, uh, West, Western academics by surprise, has forced people to rethink. And there's a lot of scholarly interest, actually. Some of, it, you know, some of the literature is very, very interesting in, in political science and other disciplines, as well as history, uh, looking again at what, uh, what, what secularism means. And of course, one of the, um, uh, one of the results is that um, uh, secularism means different things in different places. Secularism in India, for example, is a different creature to secularism in, say, France. Uh, and, and, you know, I think the comparison with uh, New Zealand and the US is something we're likely to explore uh, further. Mm. Can we just stay on the historical bit for a moment, John, while, while you're there? I mean, I said a bit tongue-in-cheek in my introduction that uh, was New Zealand a, a Christian country? And Lynn's made the point there that we've just had a four-day weekend. Not only mm. a four-day weekend, but we had closed shop, uh, shops closed on two of those days. We had no advertising on television, uh, at least one of those days. Um, I mean, you've been concerned, I know, as a historian about uh, wholly secular portrayals of New Zealand's history. Um, what, what do you make of this? I mean, is there some sense in which there's a Christian kind of vestige left? Um, you know, how do we explain the religious services, uh, Pike River and Christchurch and Karakia at public events and the religious national anthem is? <clears throat> well, I'd, I'd say, uh, say a couple of things. I'd say firstly that in the 19th century, I think the dominant form of secularism in this country was, uh, in Rowan Williams' term, uh, procedural secularism. Okay? There was some sort of anti-religious secularism around, <clears throat> and, and actually some local and quite high profile um, uh, uh, voices. Robert Stout is a good example, Dunedin lawyer who becomes the leader of the New Zealand free thought movement, which is basically a movement designed to secularise society and culture and reduce the public influence of the churches. <clears throat> so there is some of that, but, but the main reason why we developed a much greater separation between church and state in this country compared with the UK, from which most settlers come, and the reason why we developed a secular, an officially free, secular and compulsory uh, primary education system following the 1877 Education Act was not because the country was dominated by sort of atheists and agnostics who wanted to you know, sort of destroy religion in the churches. It was, it was more because the country was uh, uh, most, uh, well over 90% of the population identified as Christians of some sort and their main aim was to ensure that no established church, which might discriminate against non-Anglicans or 
perhaps non-Presbyterians down south, could emerge, um, being sort of intolerant and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and I think uh, it was the um, hostility toward religious establishments and also a desire to avoid um, uh, sectarian and religious conflict um, that helps, I think, to explain why procedural secularism trumped um, sort of doctrinaire secularism in the 19th century. But, but of course, the culture in all kinds of ways, including the political culture, in all kinds of quiet and less than obvious ways, in fact, re reflected the Christian beliefs and values of the vast majority of the people, including most of the politicians. So in fact, what's happened is the term secular has remained in, say, the education legislation, but the meaning of it now is, so it's a bit like Bryce and others were saying, that you know, there's shifts going on here with, yeah, within yeah. the term itself, so that we now understand secular, or many people would understand it, less as keeping out one particular religious denomination, but actually keeping out religion per se. That's right, that yeah, kind of as, as the culture changed, um, you know, old, wor old words can be given new meanings. And you sometimes see, you know, here in public debate, the claim that, you know, I think this is the kind of thing that Glenn was talking about. You can sometimes hear the claim, oh, we live in a secular society. Uh, as if that means that, that, that actually religious people shouldn't, uh, shouldn't express um, their beliefs and opinions and values in the public sphere. Uh, well, you know, that's, uh, you know, I think that is a problematic uh, Problematic. Yeah, well, <laughs> procedural. Are you, are you surprised that we still have like a four-day Easter? We still have Christmas. We still have public services after disasters. No, we still I'm have not prayers surprised. in Parliament. I mean, when fifty percent of the population still ticks Christian on the box, um, no, I'm not surprised, and I'm quite pleased it's there. Not only does it preserve special days for Christians or people of religion who want to observe them in that way. But uh, it's interesting that unions are amongst the strongest advocates for retention of those special days mm. uh, because it mm. provides a day off for workers and for families. So the, the day has significance not just for the religious component to it. Mm. Yeah, the other thing, just picking up on what John said there, is that the language, I think we've always got to be careful to clarify the language here because when John mentioned uh, this opposition to uh, religious establishments, mm. I think the word establishment has a very formal sense there, as in the Church of England is the established church. Mm -hmm. And you can be opposed to established church mm -hmm. while not being opposed to church. Mm -hmm. There are two different things mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Lynn, let's just come back. I mean, you're, um, you've probably got more experience than all of us of living in a, another secular country. Um, and you mentioned about the um, great difference in some ways in which uh, secularity manifests itself in, in the United States. And yet, as you know, because you were on our panel, we looked at the role of religion in, in the public square in um, America. And it's, I mean, as we, you know, as everyone knows, it virtually took over, it has taken over the debate. Almost one defines the candidates now and almost the president's being drawn into this as well in terms of, you know, their faith and is it orthodox and, and all that kind of things. Um, so given that, you know, the USA and New Zealand are both secular countries. How do we kind of account for this, this vast difference? I mean, some of you will have seen um, Anthony Hubbard's piece in the Sunday Star Times the other Sunday. Be thankful for God-free politics. And it's kind of um, picking up on the fact that, uh, you know, religion has taken over in the, the Republican primaries. We should give thanks, Hubbard says, that God has so little to do with our politics. His absence is a blessing. Look at America and see why. Um, and then he goes on about Santorum and he says Santorum would never have got anywhere in God's own. We have no problem with Christian politicians, but we expect them to keep their stuff to themselves. Um, here we often have only a vague idea what our leaders believe. So why is it so different? Well, I've got to say, I've been watching the US politics my whole adult life, and I feel, I have experienced the emergence of the religious right in politics in the United States as a baffling phenomenon, so I can't really say why it's so different. But I do kind of want to not answer your question and say something else about American politics. Um, to me, American politics really are a cautionary tale to New Zealand Christians and people of other religions who want to, be, want to have a more prominent voice. Because two things. Um, one is that the American Christians who have 
had such a very, very strong political voice, mostly very right wing, have their, their personal lives have been watched very closely and they have, many of them, fallen down dramatically in their personal lives. And for me, speaking as a Christian, I think this is just an appalling witness to the world of the, the church's um, integrity. And so I think if Christians in New Zealand, which I think they should, if they want to have more of a voice politically, they need to be really aware that people will be watching their lives. and and um, take that into account. And then I guess the second thing is my view in the United States is that the political voice has been captured by the far right. And so you basically in the 80s and 90s, the only two issues that were prominent in, in, pol in um, the political discourse was abortion and prayer in the schools. Well, you know, the New Testament talks more about care for the poor than it talks about prayer in the schools. I mean, it doesn't say anything about that. And the Old Testament, all the stuff about the caring for the alien and the migrant in your midst, and the people, the Christians who ha work endlessly and tirelessly to care for immigrants uh, in our country, illegal and, un and um, legal immigrants in the United States, um, they have had no voice in trying to, uh, to try to work for justice for immigrants. And so that part is just um, deeply sad, makes me so sad. And so if, if Christians in New Zealand want to have more of a voice, then it seems to me that they need to be thinking about um, the broad spectrum of Christian concerns that relate to politics, not just one little narrow spectrum. And I just, I wish we had more voice, and I wish that that voice was balanced across the political spectrum, really. I mean, Bryce, you're, a, as we know, keen observer of the scene here. I can't believe you don't keep half an eye open on what happens in, in other countries. I mean, do you have any reflections on this? And I mean, and, uh, so, I mean, on the American thing, but also do you think we've kind of gone to the other extreme here in just keeping God out altogether? Yeah. No, I, I can't speak much about American politics at all, but, but certainly, I'm afraid, um, but certainly I think, you know, what you're drawing out in these, uh, the main question of this about New Zealand not doing God is absolutely true. And we don't do God. We don't do God in politics. In fact, we don't really do religion, politics or sex in the sense that we don't talk about those things. Um, you know, it's, New Zealand's a very sensitive you know, country that we don't have robust debate about many things, and certainly not those areas. So, you know, um, we, you know, we don't like conflict, we don't like, um, you know, disagreement. And, you know, there was a book that came out, what, about 30 or 40 years ago about the passionless people in New Zealand. And there's a, a new edition come out this last week. And I think that's quite apt and that we don't really like to discuss the big issues. And um, so we certainly don't want politics, sex, and religion combined, so you won't see a lot of debate about you know, abortion or prayer in schools. And when we did have abortion debates, they weren't heavily religious. Hmm. It tended to be an almost a secular um, debate in some senses. And um, politicians in this country, they really play down any values or beliefs, and, and politics in general does, which my understanding is really that we have a very pragmatic sort of background and philosophy. So we don't really like politics or ideology or anything that seems too radical. Um, we like our politicians to be um, almost without ideology. And religion is a version of ideology. Mm -hmm. So um, we, no, we don't really like that. So we do have you know, politicians that are Christian, Christian MPs, but they're not Christian politicians, if you know what I mean. Um, you know, there's a difference there between so uh, MP that might call themselves Christian and a Christian politician in this country. I mean, it was interesting in your vote chats last year. Yeah. You, you, sometimes you just suddenly sprung a question at an unsuspecting candidate there and said, "Do you believe in God?" Yeah. I mean, I'm interested why you did that. And, and they jumped you... back. That's right. That's, that's, that's right. something that's normally asked of politicians here. That's right. Uh, like someone said before, it's something that's I think what. Hubbard said before what you're quoting, politicians are expected to keep their beliefs to themselves about religion. So um, it's quite unusual. For but were you surprised at some of the responses you got? Um, well, I think a lot of them did profess some sort of religion, which I wasn't aware of before that. And um, I, I don't think politicians, although they don't often 
they're not often on the front foot saying, I am a Christian, I am an Anglican, I am this. Um, they also don't really like to say, I'm an atheist. Mm. So um, mm. there's a reluctance amongst politicians to say, I am, uh, um, yeah, I don't believe in anything. So we saw, mm. I think back in 2008, there mm. was the, um, the, 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 the speaker's debate, mm. yes, uh, final leaders debate between John Key and Helen Clark. Mm. They were asked, do you believe in God? Uh, um, do you have a religion? And I'm just trying to remember what they said. It was something along the lines of... They, they were both agnostic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But both claimed to live by Christian values. Yes. So that was quite striking, I thought. That summed up a lot of what the debate is tonight. People don't like to be un-Christian or non-Christian, anti-Christian in politics, mm -hmm. but um, they're more likely to use words like agnostic if they're atheists. So Helen Clark said she was agnostic, but then since leaving office, I saw an interview with her about a year ago, she said she was an atheist. Mm -hmm. So when she was no longer running for, mm -hmm. for office, she could suddenly uh, be more open about not being religious. Complete so, opposite of Tony Blair then, who keeps yeah. his Catholicism down and then comes at, yeah. yeah. John, you so, want well, to... Well, I was just going to say, so you can be an atheist in the UN, but you've got to be agnostic in New yeah. Zealand. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say, I, I, I want to just dissent ever so slightly, and I, and I, want, to, I want to suggest that <clears throat> I thought that leaders debate that, that Bryce mentioned was actually very interesting and very illuminating when you think about it a bit, because uh, I thought it was interesting that, that both John Key and Helen Clark said, no, no, I'm an agnostic, I'm not an atheist. Um, but then both claimed, and using slightly different language, to claim to, to live by Christian values. Mm. Now, I think that language is actually kind of interesting too. Uh, and and I'm, uh, I'm inclined to think that maybe that represents our very low-key, uh, indirect, understated, Kiwi way mm. of sort of doing God. <laughs> <laughs> um, Glenn, uh, Bryce made the point that a number of politicians are Christians. I mean, I have it on fairly good authority. There's probably a higher percentage of politicians than the national average in terms of people of faith, which may say something about their calling to public service and that kind of thing. Um, do, you, do you meet them very often? I mean, do you, and do you ever talk about why they keep their faith themselves, if, if that's your experience? I'm, I'm aware of the issue, and I think it's um, probably akin to Tony Blair's comment when he left office, which is that if you talk about God, people think you're nuts. And that was his exact words, that actually. Was his I think exact I'm a nutter. Yes, yeah. that's right. So um, it, it represents a challenge because when we're talking about secularism, especially the sort of programmatic form which wants to keep religion away from the public square, uh, the kind of issue that that raises for me is what do you do when religion may actually be part of the solution to the problems you're addressing? So if you're looking at social dislocation, if you're looking at Christchurch post the quake, um, when you look at the amount of work that the churches did, I mean, frequently in most of those suburbs, eastern suburbs, the first person to knock on the doors after the, that February earthquake was the local church. But you wouldn't have known that from listening to the media or listening to politicians. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was at a white ribbon event in Wellington and an, a member of parliament uh, who was doing one of the speeches uh, listed a roll call of honour of people that should be honoured for the work that they do in terms of domestic violence and so on. And nowhere in this list of 10 names was the church, which probably does more than any other organisation. Um, I mean, I could, I could list numerous examples, Families Commission and other groups, where this was happening. And it concerns me because when we are wrestling with social and public issues, if we, if we sort of marginalise or exclude religion or religious things before we even begin the discussion, mm -hmm. then it may be that a big part of the solutions that we're looking for is cut out before we even start. But could I turn the tables on you a bit there um, and say, but isn't that the church is failing or the various churches failing, that they're not standing up and um, to the plate and um, you know, putting forward you know, quite political or you know, voicing their, their, you know, making voice on some of these big issues? They do the social work, like you say, you know, from door to door and you know, very important things, but we don't actually often hear the churches in public debate a lot. Well, in the spirit of breaking out of this non-confrontational model that Bryce alluded to, <laughs> um, <coughs> and just making a little nudge here, it's frequently not that the church... I mean, f firstly, the, the churches don't want to blow their own trumpet. There's this, if, and it's an ugly thing. When you see churches blowing their own trumpets, usually that attracts criticism of another sort. But frequently, churches do try to comment on issues... And, and people are aware of the work that the church does, but it's almost as if there's a kind of theophobic attitude that uh, is happy to acknowledge 
the good work that's done by any of these organisations over here and there, but we better not mention the church in case somebody takes offence. And, uh, and again, that's part of excluding things of religion out of the public square. So that's the programmatic secularism that I think we need to be careful of. So you think that the church is kind of excluded, marginalised, and they want to be part of the debate, but aren't given a chance? Yeah, and, and I think, again, coming back to the point that both um, previous speakers have mentioned, it is a complex situation. So there's, it's not a simple picture here just to say the church is excluded. In many ways, and I think, uh, for example, of a a friend from one church who works closely in policy with government, when he talks to his colleagues from around the world, they can't believe how good the relationship is between government and church in New Zealand. And in many areas, it is quite a positive relationship, but it's, it's as if it's off the radar. Yeah, well, that's the classic <clears throat> insider-outsider yeah. press group system where the loud voices are the ones that are excluded, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. why they have to be loud, and in the media all the time, the, the effective interest groups are the ones that quietly have good relations yeah. with, uh, with the powers that be, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it could, could be, Glenn, that there's just um, general ignorance at high level of what churches are doing rather than a specific attempt to marginalise or belittle what they do. I mean, I only say that because in the UK, where you have a state church. Um, I, before I came here, I did a piece of research for the Church of England bishops at the centre I was based at. And we discovered a complete lack of knowledge among government departments of what churches were doing at grassroots level. The fact is the Church of England has been at the centre of every single community for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it does a lot of delivery of social good at grassroots level. It's often the hub of the community. And the amount of data that the um, government departments had on the church was absolutely minimal. It was quite embarrassing compared to, for example, what they would have on other faith traditions in the United, St uh, in the United Kingdom where perhaps you might feel politically they wanted to keep more of a kind of eye on what was going on. So that wasn't a deliberate attempt to sideline the church because, after all, the church is part of the institutional fabric in, in, in England. Um, but it was just that it, the church got on with it, so why should the government worry about it? You know. Well, there is a dialogue at various levels in New Zealand between uh, the government and the church. So national church leaders meet with the Prime Minister or Prime Minister's office and, and other senior members of the government. Um, social policy units, the New Zealand Council of Christian Social mm. Services meet regularly, so there's that sort of interaction. But you would never know it from watching the six o'clock mm -hmm. news. Mm -hmm. And you would never know the work that's done by the church. So the, so the difficulty that this creates is that uh, people of faith are not simply out there trying to do good works. There is that sense in which they do also want people to know that God is real, God is alive, God is at work in our communities. And if that part doesn't ever get into the public domain, if it's only the churches that tell that message, but nobody else ever acknowledges it, it sort of has that sense, well, of course, it's like the Toyota ad. You'd expect them to say that because mm -hmm. it's Toyota. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's the issue. Just while we're talking about politicians and faith, um, Presumably you all saw Russell Norman's uh, address in reply, um, which was a fascinating piece, I thought, of public theology from someone who two or three times in the course of that says, well, I'm saying this as an atheist. Um, what did, Bryce, what did you make of it? Did you oh, see that? I did, and I think that does represent that there's still uh, um, a desire or a resonance in the public for some sort of beliefs or um, spirituality. So you hear a lot of people in politics talk about um, yeah, spirituality is, is the word more, used mm. more than mm. religious beliefs. Mm. Um, so I think you can be a, probably an atheist or a, um, <laughs> agnostic and still have some sort of spirituality, apparently. Mm. Oh, was it, I'm was not sure it, if that's a contradiction <laughs> or not. Was but, it easier for him to say as an atheist? Than oh, than that's right, that's right, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, because, you know, you couldn't have Bill English talking about that, no. Because he's the person that's probably most identified as a religious politician. And no, I don't think he could have said that without being um, boxed in. So like I was saying, you know, um, there's a lot of politicians who are Christian, but not many Christian politicians. And I mean, I was thinking about this on the way here tonight, thinking, oh, who are the Christian politicians? And I couldn't really think of many apart from Bill English, <laughs> which I think does say quite a lot. Mm. Well, and well, yet well, someone told me half, probably half yeah, the cabinet are probably quite, in church quite once or twice a month. Yeah. So, yeah, sorry. Well, I was just going to say, um, I mean, things change. And I think the Russell Norman um, uh, thing is a, an interesting example. I mean, uh, if you look at Chris Trotter's uh, recent sort of popular history of New Zealand, No Left Turn, um, he locates the, 
the origins of the New Zealand left in, uh, in first century Palestine <laughs> with, a, with the life and teachings of a certain Jewish rabbi. Um, and uh, I mean, I think that uh, I, I noticed that in the last election, some of the Labour Party uh, politicians actually made explicit mention. I think David Cunliffe mentioned, oh, he's, a, he's an Anglican, the son of a minister, I think. Um, so you just never know how things might develop. Um, uh, you know, what's this space? I mean, one of the things Bill English said a couple of years ago at St Margaret's College was that in Australia, uh, th th that in America everybody has to do God, in Australia they almost do God. And that was interesting because that was a reference not just to John Howard, who sort of did God in various ways. And so did Rudd, of course. Precisely. Yeah. Kevin Rudd did. And actually in, in the public sphere at times. Mm. You know, and I think that's interesting. You can read essays online about Bonhoeffer by, uh, by Kevin Rudd. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Let's come back to something we've touched on um, and unpack it a bit more about um, the, the quality of our public discourse here. We've I mean, Bryce, you said we don't get very deeply into issues all that much. Um, is this connected with our perceived secularity? In other words, do we have a kind of reticence about bringing, you know, whether, whether they're from a religious perspective or not, our kind of values and convictions and beliefs into the public square? And does that mean that sometimes we don't drill down very deeply into some of the issues that we, that we look at? Will we have a better level of conversation if, um, if we felt a bit freer in public discourse to, um, to air our views a bit. I mean, there's a, John mentioned the scholarship that's going on around this issue. There's this term confessional candour mm -hmm. which is coming out, which means, you know, kind of people feel they should be freer to talk about the deeper values that drive them when they're talking about public issues. Would that, is, you know, is there a link between the paucity or coarseness, as Rowan Williams calls it, of our public discourse and, and our perceived secularity? Um, mm -hmm. Bryce, do you want to... Absolutely, yeah, I think that's a good way of, of, of putting it, actually. <coughs> um, I mean, I would just reiterate that, um, you know, there's a lack of, yeah, public debate in all forms in New Zealand. If you look at broadcasting, the quality there, or lack of it. If you look at, you know, any other print um, publications, um, any sorts of public meetings, there's not a lot going on. This sort of thing you're holding is kind of the exception, um, you know, to what's going on. Universities don't play a very big part in public intellectualism. Um, so, so generally we're a very quiet um, nation that's afraid to have these robust debates. So absolutely, if we talked about our own values a bit more, that might mm. be an Because some of the issues that we've got up front, you know, um, alcohol abuse and mm. child abuse and economic inequality and prison numbers, which are way out of all mm. proportion to the crime rate, um, euthanasia is going to be an issue again this year, I think. I mean, these are issues that really do get to the heart of what we are as human beings and our whole kind of anthropology and our view of society and the common good. All these things, you know, there's a reticence, isn't there? I mean, how, how would that, how could we break that down? Or, I mean, it's not something we'd do overnight, but I mean, do you see any signs of light at the end of the tunnel with that? You know, in terms of a better, well, any of you really, in terms of a better <laughs> can, discourse. Can I, can, I just, uh, can I just respond with an historical perspective? Surprise, surprise. <laughs> um, You're earning your money, John. Uh, I mean, I've been struck during the course of recent research by how many institutions in 19th century New Zealand explicitly forbade uh, discussions about religion and politics. They actually have it in their bylaws at times. Uh, so, and you can understand, given the, um, the religious differences and their, and their political potency, the, 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 the potential for division, um, in the old world, in the UK and Europe, why we developed, I think, this... Uh, you know, I, I don't know who it was that said, you, uh, you, you asked him about God and he sort of jumped back <laughs> inwardly. Well, I think that is the, that's the standard response, not only amongst Kiwi politicians for, for yonks, but among the general public. Mm -hmm. but, but I do think... I, think... I think you're right, Andrew, that, I mean, my own view um, is that actually religion and politics are among the most interesting subjects, mm -hmm. whatever your views on them, you know, uh, and that in a sense, while you can understand um, uh, why uh, New Zealanders sort of individually and collectively have, have sort of tried to avoid 
our deepest differences, um, I think it probably has had the effect of, to some degree, impoverishing mm -hmm. our public <coughs> discourse. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and that means um, the, uh, <coughs> the, the, the way our, um, our culture and, and society and politics actually works. Yeah, and you can see why that's the case, because if, if you're saying to people, in order to enter the debate, you have to keep private those things that are most central to who you are mm -hmm. and why you think what you think. Mm -hmm. You've now challenged people to try and come up with a whole bunch of language uh, to discuss things that they're not comfortable with and, and so therefore it probably leads a little bit to that sort of silence. And, and if you don't get practice at the debate, and I think what's coming through this idea of confessional candour is that now we're starting to see that the, the best public square is when people are actually able to enter it with all of who they are and express their views and why they hold those views. Now, the final decisions that the state needs to come to in terms of legislation and so on, that's, that's a different matter. But at least let us have the debate. At least let's bring everything that I feel about. Let's overcome this passionless people and, and come to the discussion and bring everything that we want. And I think that would make for a much healthier public square. I actually have a question. Mm. So I've been quite surprised by the anti-intellectual mm. uh, sort of flavor of New Zealand society. And um, I mean, I was actually really surprised by that. And it's fantastic to be in Dunedin where there's a university and there is quite a lot of intellectual discussion going on. But which comes first, the anti-religious, anti-talk about deep emotional things or the anti-intellectual, mm. or did they grow up simultaneously in New Zealand, and how are those two things connected to each other? That sounds like a historical question, John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes to which part of my question, though? I had like yes, a I, whole bunch yeah. of layers of yeah, the question. Yes, yes, I think they grew up together. Mm. OK, yeah. OK. Yeah. But, I mean, there's various answers they put forward by um, academics and theorists about why we live in such a society in New Zealand and why it might be more extreme than other countries and it normally <coughs> relates to our settler origins and um, supposedly um, colonisation whereby a lot had to be done on the land with very practical efforts mm. and mm. eerie fairy ideas about anything yeah. were not about survival, were not about um, the harsh you know, realities of New Zealand life developing a colony yeah. and so we stuck with that anti-intellectual, anti-theory idea and it's been I think progressed by a lot of other you know things coming into the mix. Mm. Um, mm. You know, yeah, I mean, I, yeah I think it was quite well developed in English yeah. settler culture even before uh, the settlers came mm. uh, but, but, I, but I think it certainly takes off here uh, and, and of course you can understand why you can understand why there was this determination to avoid talking about religion and politics mm. in, in the 19th century context because, of course, uh, religious differences were extremely powerful back in the UK, extremely potent and divisive right through the 19th century. Um, you know, people still spilt blood over them. Uh, you know, and, and, of course, in, in Northern Ireland, that you know, has barely gone away. Um, so you can understand why uh, New Zealanders wanted to build, own, build God's own country by not doing God. Mm. There is a kind of very serious side to this anti-intellectualism in the sense that you often, well, I don't know often, but more than you would like, you hear of policy being decided without much reference to evidence. Mm. Um, there seems to be a kind of instinct that drives policy makers and sometimes you hear a debate on the radio, you know, where sort of an intellectual or someone who's an expert will put forward a point of view, but the politicians will say, well, actually, we don't agree with that. We want to do this, that and the other. I mean, that, that is kind of a worrying thing, isn't it? Or, or is it actually how democracy works? You know? And my question is, how is that connected, that phenomenon connected to the lack of religious values being talked about in the public square. Yeah. Are, are those two things connected or do they just grow up side by side and they're not related to well, each I'm other? Well, I'm not on the panel. Do you have any yeah. ideas yourself? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd endorse the question because I think it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, has, has the sort of form of secularism in New Zealand and the... I, I don't want to paint this too bad because I think that religious people in New Zealand of all faiths and Christians in particular 
Uh, we have things pretty good in New Zealand relative to Christians in many parts of the world. Uh, we have a huge freedom to worship mm -hmm. and we do have freedoms to influence into the public square. So I'm talking about you know, those areas where we kind of rub up against it a little bit. And I think the question that's asked is, is very good. To what extent has that um, marginalisation or what, what John talked about, people are actually writing it into their bylaws that there won't be any discussion on these topics. To what extent has that led decades further on to this paucity of public debate? And I think it's a significant issue. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to throw the debate open in a few minutes to the audience, so um, maybe people have got answers or, God forbid, further questions that they want to ask. So, um... can, can I just uh, ask one thing, Andrew? Um, a number of times in the discussion so far, and this again is in the spirit of breaking out of this non-controversial <laughs> thing. But, you can uh, argue with each other as much as you like. But, uh, <laughs> we'll see each other outside in the car park afterwards. <laughs> but this is um, the number of times that we hear the phrase, we, New Zealand is a secular country. And, and I'm, you know, we, we've sort of had a bit of discussion about these labels, but I'm just not sure I'm comfortable with that one any more than I'd be comfortable with the label, we're a Christian nation. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't actually know what either of those means. Would everybody in the country need to be card-carrying Christian before we could call ourselves a Christian nation? Or what does it mean when we say we're secular, when over half the country still ticks Christian and there's other faith groups as well? So I'd prefer to use words like we're religiously plural, Mm. Um, I think Rex Ardar from the law faculty here has talked about us being a sort of de facto uh, Christian country in the sense that many of the institutions of our society have been shaped by the Christian faith strongly and powerfully. Um, but I, I don't think we need to keep repeating this notion we're a secular country because that probably uh, sort of takes us down that, that, in the end, I think it could end up inhibiting debate if we keep buying into that label. Well, and, and I wonder how helpful that is for people of faith who perhaps don't want to see a division between secularity and spiritual. I mean, in a sense, it kind of buys into that dichotomy, which perhaps, as you say, might not be helpful at the end. Can I, I just finish by saying, though, that the, um, I think there is still a fear of admitting religious voices into the public square. And I have to say, I don't think that fear is well-founded, because one of my activities is involved with national interfaith dialogues, where we meet regularly with leaders from Muslim groups, Hindu, Buddhist, and so on. And we've been working with the Human Rights Commission since 2007 on a range of documents which you can access off the Human, Re Human Rights Commission website. And these documents are the, are the fruit of some very robust discussions amongst the leaders of these faith groups. But we, are f we have become friends through that process. Mm. And I think we've produced some documents which will actually help, for example, the last one on religion in the workplace, I think could prevent in New Zealand the kind of problems that we've seen occurring over in France mm. with burqa mm. and in Britain with wearing of crosses and other things. I, do, I don't think we'll have these problems in New Zealand because we actually have a robust debate. And what I'd be saying is let's bring that even further into the public square. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That exactly fits with what I wanted to follow up on, if that's OK. Um, I'm teaching a paper next semester on ministry in a multicultural society. So for the last year, I've been reading book after book after book about multicultural societies. Uh, most of the books, unfortunately, come from the US or the UK, not many from New Zealand. But um, we, the, I, I really think that the elephant in the living room that we're dealing with um, in all English-speaking societies and most of Europe is the huge number of immigrants that are making an increasing percentage of our population. And interestingly, one of the little tidbits that I came across is that the majority of migrants in the world today are Christian. So it's really important for New Zealanders to realize that the, the, the um, style of Christianity that we've had in New Zealand it has been a uni United Kingdom and Ireland, you know, British Isles dominated mm -hmm. Um, brand of Christianity and what if, if Christians are going to be in the public square in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years and, and if we who you know are articulate English speakers want to help give other people a voice then we have to realize that, that, that there will be not only the voice of Muslims and Hindus who have immigrated here but voices of Christians from Africa and Korea and many other places in the world who haven't been a part of the public dialogue in New Zealand up until mm -hmm. now. Um, yeah, I just, I think that's got to be something that we, I feel like a, a Christian value is to give voice to the voiceless. And right now, the immigrants in this country, and frankly, the immigrants in all the countries I've been looking at, 
have no voice, really. And to give a voice to them, I think we're going to be stunned at the values that some of the people from other countries, whether they're Christians from other countries or Hindus or Muslims, some of the values that they have, I think we're just going to be really surprised could, by them. Could I just add something naughty? <laughs> that, that a proportion of the, these new folks that Lynn is talking about will be Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's another elephant in the room that I'll just quickly mention. That, <laughs> yeah. uh, when we're yeah. talking about Christian yeah. politics, the other elephant I think that we haven't mentioned is um, people like Brian Tamaki. So, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. when most people you ask them about Christian politics, I, I don't know, when I talk to students about it, mm -hmm. um, the first you know, thing that comes mm -hmm. to their mind is Destiny Church, Brian Tamaki, and or maybe 10 or 20 years ago it would have been Graham Capel and the Christian Heritage Party. So I feel that's got a large mm -hmm. part to play in people's perceptions of Christian politics, mm. uh, for better or worse, mm. Mm. Uh, you decide. Mm. But um, so if, if Christian politicians or Christian political activists want to have a larger voice, I think they have to think about the fact that um, at the moment the field has been left mm -hmm. to politicians like uh, Brian Tamaki, for better or worse. Mm -hmm. and. Um, yeah, the longer that it's left like that, the worse the problem. Or is that a reflection of the fact that the media, at the end of the day, need to arouse our interest? They need to get more viewers. They need to sell papers. And so, someone like Brian Tamaki and Destiny Church is more likely to be slightly edgy and slightly doing stuff that's more newsworthy. Whereas what Glenn's been saying is churches getting on, feeding the poor, running creches, that kind of thing. That's not that's but not headline news. Is that's it? right. But nonetheless, it's a reality that um, the political churches have to deal with mm -hmm. and confront, and the what I think is sort of an absence of strategy, which I'm, I'm probably quite wrong about, appears to be this, um, leads to this situation where people think Christian politics, Brian Timothy. So you need to be much more PR savvy, Glenn. Oh, I'll, talk to, I'll be talking to uh, myself. Uh, you'll correct me later. <laughs> the, um, no, but I was talking to Lynn beforehand and, and saying a, a story sh a few years ago when I had lunch with a, a journalist from one of the uh, national media. And uh, I said to him, how do you go about, in, in the face of what, exactly what Bryce is talking about, how do you go about getting a, a moderate or a reasonable or a balanced Christian voice into the media? And he said, forget it. <laughs> that was his two-word answer. Um, and it might have been a little bit cynical, but he said, you know, we're, we're under big deadlines. Uh, we have stories to get out. We've got tight budgets. And essentially, we have speed dials on our phones. And when a story crops up, it's, it's who are the people that are going to give us the diametrically opposed mm -hmm. positions mm -hmm. so that we can get the story out quick and it will grab readers' attention. So that is a challenge. It's not that churches are not putting out statements on a regular basis. Uh, it's not that they're critiquing policy um, and making submissions on all sorts of government legislation. Uh, it's that it's very difficult to get that kind of voice into the public square. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just one quick thing, we've talked about the public square quite a bit. Where, where is it in New Zealand? Um, you know, <laughs> well, you send around a daily digest of, uh, I mean, there's as much stuff from blogs as there is from anything else. Yes, the blog sphere is one, one element. Mm. Yeah. And mm. social media will be, mm. continues to be. You know, mm. Facebook or um, Twitter or whatever is going to be a huge part of the conversation. Yeah. But, I mean, the free-to-air television, for example, very little programs of any analysis or well, discussion? Well, we, uh, we have on TVNZ7 um, you know, some glimmers of what it could be, and it was about a week ago they had on Media 7 a, a focus on um, religion exactly. and broadcasting, exactly. which was very interesting. Exactly. But we're going to lose that. Uh, but we're about to lose that, that's right. <laughs> Does that worry you? Oh, absolutely. I, I think that's uh, uh, one important thread within the you know, sphere of public intellectualism that, yeah, and they're yeah. dripping away, sort of, yeah. And finally, Glenn, you mentioned the census a couple of times and the 50% of people who are Christian. I mean, that number may probably drop at the next census, but one figure that will go up, even if it's just slightly, is the number of non-Christian faiths, Muslim, Hindu, Sikh. Mm. I mean, would you welcome their voice in the public square as, as much as the church? I, I think if you have an open public square, it has to be open to all. So I don't think we can ask sort of special pleading, as if it were, to say, mm -hmm. we want Christian voices in, but we want to exclude these other voices. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's been said before, but to do this is actually going to make the public square a bit noisier. <laughs> it's going to be a little bit more complicated for a while. Um, it'll be quite confused. But I think that's a process we have to go through uh, if we want to get the kind of debate that we've been talking about. OK, um, I'm going to open it up. I've just got one interesting text question here. Would Glynn concede that although we are a culturally Christian nation, our collective social values have come from secularism, not the Bible? Do you want no. to think about that? <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. 
Well, we I, might come I, back. Although, although I, I will concede to whoever asked the question that I think there is an, an interesting interplay. Religion often gets it wrong. <laughs> and that's something that I think as Christians we have to sort of fess up to and say there are many times when we look back through church history where we get it famously wrong. And so it's at times like that that other voices, and sometimes they can be secular voices, they could be voices of other religions. Um, we have to be open. To, if, if, if Christians talk about being open to hearing the voice of God, we have to remember a story in the Bible which uh, that voice one time came through a donkey. <laughs> and uh, we have to be prepared to hear it from wherever it comes from. So I certainly would say that it's the interplay between those voices that's been helpful. Got one further question just before we throw it open, which is a bit tangential to what we're talking about, but quite an interesting one. Easter is an excellent example of the propriety of northern religious festivals. Easter marking the ancient pre-Christian um, observation, observance of the end of winter and the beginning of spring with the themes of facing the future with the possibilities of rebirth, renewal and growth. Does the panel think we need to review the seasonality and understanding of these calendar events? Just very quickly. Um, Christmas in the middle of winter, so, sure. Yeah. Oh, I was actually going to say, tell a little anecdote that illustrates the first question but draws on the seasons of the second question. So I've only been stopped three times to be breathalyzed in um, Dunedin, and the first time was on Good Friday. And I just thought that that was so fascinating that the... Obviously, so much drinking is going on on Good Friday that that's a, a prime day to be out checking to breathalyze. And so that, to me, illustrates the fact that, yeah, possibly the values of everyday life for lots of people really are more informed by the secular culture than by the religious culture. I mean, I was just stunned. I wouldn't be drinking on Good Friday. Well, it's all the church people coming back from communion. Oh, all right. <laughs> all right. That's going to put them over the limit. <laughs> But there is this call for Christmas in July, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. Well, we've hit, hit our deadline, and as always with our panel discussions, we could go on for a lot longer, and um, I'm sorry we can't go on any further now, but um, thank you very much, the four of you, for giving us a real wealth of material and uh, thought-provoking stuff to think about, and um, this is a, a debate that I'm sure will continue. I know it will continue, and um, thank you very much for being with us and sharing with us your views and thoughts, and thank you for joining us in the studio here. And thank you online, if you are online, for um, tuning in and watching. And this will be available as a podcast very soon as well, if you know of people who've missed it and want to see it. Let's just thank our panel for their contribution. <laughs>